Let's get it! You need any You just open double door, you son. <laughs> Double boys, son. Strategy. Man, dude, I almost got screwed over today because of that. And technology. So, I think that we're, we got a little Commander Cast connection there. Maybe. Tenuous. Tenuous at best. CommanderCast.com Hello, everyone, and welcome to Commander Cast episode 237. We're your weekly source for community, strategy, and technology, hosted on mtgcast.com and our home site, commandercast.com. We're recording this on February 17th, 2016. I'm your host of the show, William, and join me, as always, is my perennial co-host, Clay. How are you doing today, sir? I am doing just fine. Just fine. Now, this past weekend was, in fact, Valentine's Day. You and Mary doing anything special? Um, well... Mallory was amazing and got me a Nintendo 64 for Valentine's Day, which I've been wanting for, I guess, about 18 years. I saw uh, that. Wait, 18 years? Yeah, the system's that old. No, no, I mean, like, you've been waiting 18 years for an N64? I've been wanting one for 18 years. Oh. Like, my, my parents never, uh... We didn't have a console growing up until I was... Later in elementary school, and I lobbied for a GameCube, and for some reason, against my advice, we bought a really, really shitty refurbished Xbox. I was the only one that ever used it, and they should have listened to me and just bought me the damn GameCube. Aw, man, you could have had Super Smash Brothers. Exactly, but... Like, like, I think that was available just on launch, too. Um, after many years of pestering my cousins to give me their old game systems... Mallory took it upon herself to just go ahead and get me said system, and it is wonderful. What'd you get it from? Um, We have a retro game store near our campus called Lost Ark. Um, It is really, really cool, and they had some systems there, and so she went and got one. Nice. I actually saw the setup that you built for that, too, on Twitter. Yeah. It would be nice if it was made of wood and not cardboard, but... It, yeah, I'm sure you can find some discount yeah. shelvings on Amazon. Um, but anyways, what we actually did on Valentine's Day was we went to a bunch of different um, like used game stores and stuff like that just to see what they had. Um, ended up picking up a uh, like transfer pack for Game Boy games, um, a copy of Glover, <laughs> because Mallory said that I need to play it. So, yeah. And then we got a nice dinner, and then we came back. All right. Nice. So... <laughs> Aside from just Clay, we also have the Waffle Cone. Jacob joined us today. How are you doing today, sir? Doing great. All right. So how was your weekend, Jake? Uh, pretty hectic. I just got a new job and trying to get a get a hold of. I, I work at a uh, at Lowe's, so it's really hard to because I work in the hardware department. I got a like people ask me like, hey, I need this bolt. I need this screw. You know, <laughs> I don't know where they are. <laughs> All right. And then Calvin, do we sell static on your end? What was that? Do we still have static on your end? Yes, you do. Okay, then. Uh, so, actually, I... So... Jacob, Jacob, are you muted right now? Yeah. Okay, because okay, cause a lot... Some of the static I'm getting right now is from your end. Okay, I'll just keep my stuff muted, and then when I'm going to talk, I can just... Uh, All right, that works. Oh, I'm yeah. That's saying, like, it's not just the static on my end, it's... Uh, you guys keep cutting in and out, so it's like you're saying things, and I hear part of the conversation, and then you disappear, and then you come back in. So it's less of me hearing static, and less of me not hearing what you're actually saying. All right. I think you might just have connection problems. Yeah, so I'm having some issues with my connection. All right, then. Um, Calvin, you can go ahead and take the night off, then, and I'll get in touch with you after we're done recording, all right? All right, so once every once you guys are done recording, you know, well, you have my number, right? Uh, Yeah, I've got your number. I'll just give you a call. Yeah, just feel free to give me a call. We'll talk about stuff and things. And uh, Sorry, gentlemen, that I'll have to bow out. I'm sorry to the listeners that the captain will have to take the evening off. But hopefully everything on my end will be working next week, and I'll be able to come back and be able to do whatever we'll be talking about then. Yeah. All right, and hey, next week we'll have but, Cassidy with Joan Damage Control on. Yeah. And, you know, 
So before I go, I'm just going to tell all the listeners, don't worry, Calvin's fine. And he still wants you to give us the tip and just a tip because <laughs> we here at Commander Cast are still on Patreon. And if you do get a chance to go over there and just slip it in one dollar. <laughs> Thanks, Calvin. I'll talk to you. Always later. a plug. And I'm out. All right. All righty. And count up. All right, so it'll just be us three today. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so continuing on. All right, guys, it's time for that favorite thing that we do every week, and that is favorite commanders of the week. Clay, who's your favorite commander this week? Tassigur is too strong. That is what I'm going to say. Granted, over the past week I got my first game loss in a really long time playing French at the store. Um, and kind of our finals round... I played against a Send Triplets control deck, and they actually got a game on me. Oh, that new mana roll helping out? Hmm? Like, uh, like, were they doing, like, it, the... I would think they would have, be snapping clean stuff like Chromatic Lantern, so they could actually catch your stuff without the, yeah. uh, the Dawn's Glare or something. I think so. Um, we chatted about it a little bit afterwards, and he talked about maybe adding that sort of thing in. Um, we talked about how... Risky Micah Synthlatus is, and how tempting it is to play. But I mean, with a deck like the way he was playing it, it's basically like you can't let him start the turn with Send Triplets, or you'll probably just lose. Mm. Especially if you're playing it in the Control Mirror, because it just gives him free reign to do whatever he wants. Yeah, like, I can see that. the The reason I lost the first game was because I had been, like, beating him, up, beating him up a little bit with True Name Nemesis. Um, and, like, he played a couple dudes. He had Scytherix on the board, which, thankfully, I had Maze of Ith for. And then he finally played his Send Triplets. And I was like, well, I need to get that Send Triplets off the board, but the only thing left in my hand that can do that is Crux of Fate. So we're going to destroy all non-dragon creatures. And so my True Name had to go bye-bye, and I was really sad, and that actually lost me the game. But it was what was necessary at the time. At the time. Okay. Uh, Jacob, who is your favorite commander this week? I'm going to have to go with Child of Valara. I've been uh, playing this lands deck. <laughs> uh, with, like, uh, my win condition is Maze of Zen. I approve. And uh, it, it's really good. I've been doing this trick where I um, where I use Storm Cauldron and, uh, like, Mana Web to bounce, uh, bounce everyone's lands up to their hand, and then I have uh, Mana Bond, so I just dump everything back down, and and uh, yeah, that's it. Really, that's <laughs> really mean. fun. Yeah. That's hilarious, but that is mean. Yeah. I wish I had the money for a Tabernacle of Pindrel Veil, but we don't <laughs> all have, you know, $700 laying around. <laughs> Fair. Well, if you get them on Moto, Tabernacle's only like... Uh, I think I let's see. I actually have this written. I think down. it's like thirteen or fourteen dollars. I think it's fifteen online. Yeah, I know because I was actually just looking up the legends uh, cards for the next edition of the Alpha Belt, which going into my favorite commander of the week is Avacyn, Guardian Angel, because I'm still playing just her on Moto. I should act. It's also a combination of me not being able to get into my store the past couple of weeks. Because again, on Tuesday, I was taken actually to a procedure. Uh, a week before that was something needed to happen. I think that might have been the only night I could record then too. But well, I'm, I'm finding out that Abyssin's a lot more of a team player type commander. She needs a lot of pieces to kind of protect her. You know, because she can't protect herself, but she can protect other people. And a lot of the problems I was having with the deck, with the first initial list, was that I just didn't have enough creatures for her to really protect. Stuff with, like, Banny, it's, oh my god, I'm having so much fun with the Banny. It's only on the Banalish Hero on Moto. <laughs> but it's great, because I can actually just give the Banalish Hero protection from whatever it is I need protection from. Let Avacyn block with the Banalish Hero, assign all the damage to Banalish Hero. Hero's going to absorb all the damage, and Avacyn can get in there and actually kill stuff. So that's actually been pretty fun. Right now, I'm looking at the stuff from Legends, and that's got a lot of really powerful cards, like the land tags and the moats, and stuff I'm really excited to get for the deck. 
I see at the time that you guys are hearing this though, you actually just got the Arabian Nights videos. So I'm working on getting a nice little buffer there. I think I need to play a I can use this opportunity to play a few more games though to get a better idea of what I'm gonna be cutting for what. The antiquities helped just for getting a lot of the artifact creatures out. I did get to use Mishra's Workshop, which was sweet. So you guys will see that in a couple of weeks. The Arabian Nights videos it's the first one I've, I've made a, uh, a custom thumbnail. I'm so, I'm not great with like Photoshop or even MS Paint, but it's better than just leaving up a generic picture of Addison and making all the videos look the same. <laughs> so it's the first real project I've had where I look at it and I'm like, Ugh, this isn't quite good enough. I want to try and make it just a little bit better. You know, I'm getting off work and when I'm looking at like the list, figuring out what to cut, anything like that, it's actually a lot of fun. To try and figure out, well, do I really want to cut Rod of Ruin? Like, it's three mana to tap and ping something, but it's three mana to tap and ping something. I've been killing a couple of things with it. It also just shoots Planeswalkers, which the deck kind of needed help with because it wasn't creature heavy, but now it does have creatures. So, a lot of interesting thought experiments going on with this. I do really like Urza's Glasses, though. Which is just the one man artifact tap, look at someone's hand. Like, I'm actually having more fun with that than I should be. So, oh. you can. So, you guys will be able to see that on the YouTube channel. I actually have a link to the YouTube channel in the show notes right there with the link to the Patreon. Which, we can go ahead and talk about how you can give us the tip with Calvin's little insertion right here. Eh? Let's see what I did there. Okay. That was good right there. <laughs> ah, tip insertion. I cracked myself. Okay. <clears throat> so, if you guys want to go ahead and get on this discussion, go ahead, tweet us, message us on the Facebooks, hit us up on the Reddits, leave us comments in the, in the, uh, the show below comments, comments below the shows, stuff like that. Today, we're going to be talking about combos. And this is something that Jacob actually come, came up with, which I'm very glad because I was actually kind of stuck on what to have a show about. But, you know, combos, Bayonetta came out, she's combo perfect. her game's combo perfect. been playing a little bit of that. So, just, I just kind of ha have this chain of thought in my head, you know, just about combos. So let's go ahead and talk about that. We're going to talk about, you know, combos versus synergy and all the little mini arguments that come with talking about combos. In just a minute, we'll get to our community segment. Stay tuned, everyone. We'll be right back. So, before we go ahead and get started about talking about combo, we actually kind of need to define combo, because combo is one of those, you know, archetypes where you really have to act to figure out, okay, is this a combo, or is this actually just, you know, synergy? Because I built a lot of decks where the effects build off each other. Like, oh, untapping and tapping shenanigans, like with a Derevi deck, where, you know, there's just a lot of interconnecting synergy. Now, after you start building a deck for a while, you go, okay, this card goes great with these, this card helps build these cards up, and they have a strong synergy. But at what point does it become combo? And Clay, since you're the residential combo player, <laughs> what, what's your take on that? Well, I think the difference between synergy and combo, at least in terms of our format, is essentially, does it end the game? Does it create some sort of loop that will end the game? Does it create some sort of infinite loop that will kill that will kill everyone and end the game. That is basically where I draw the line. Like, I'm watching Joe Lissette play Legacy right now, and he's playing, uh, like, Thopter Foundry with Sword of the Meek and Legacy. And, like, while that is technically a combo, at least in our format, that would be seen as synergy because it does not actively end the game. It simply gives you dudes and gains you life, but doesn't actually kill your opponents. Whereas something like throwing in a Blasting Station with those two cards and some way to make more mana off of that. To infinitely activate it, yes, that would be a combo. It is a combination of cards that ends up killing everyone. Okay, so, Jacob, you said you would take the opposite side, side of this. Why should combo be defined, and why shouldn't combo be defined as, you know, the game-ending point of the combo? The Ornithopter's uh, Foundry combo actually is a well-known way to just kind of get an absurd amount of life and to keep people from killing you. Yes. Well, 
I don't think I agree with Clay that like on the definition of a combo, like between like a like synergy is like the Soul Sisters modern deck, like everything works together as one like a uh, machine to to eke out advantage. But a combo is like the Splinter Twin deck of modern stage past that will end the game on the spot. I, I agree with him on that. Oh, uh, that's just. A- no, I I will disagree later. <laughs> okay. About like, like that, that that's not what I was meaning. I was meaning like I'll disagree with like oh we shouldn't play two card combos. I'll I'll disagree about that. Okay. Well then I actually ha- do have a little bit of something there. Uh, Jacob, if you can mute so I can get the yeah. back of it. Thank you. Now see the the way I see it is that with a combo you're looking for a very specific result, less of a I'm kind of just building on top of each other, and more of a, I know specifically that this card and this card are going to do this together, and the whole point is to, is to just create a condition that wouldn't be possible without these specific cards. Like with the owner, like with the uh, Sword of the Meek and the, what was it, Thopter Assembly? Thopter Foundry? Yeah, Thopter Foundry and Sword of the Meek. Yeah, Thopter Foundry and Sword of the Meek. I could see that a combo because it's specifically those two cards working together to create the result of, oh, I'm going to keep getting a bunch of life. I'm going to keep making a bunch of dudes that are going to cycle through each other. I mean, that's only one card away, like adding like uh, a blood artist or something, to being a combo killer. It's not necessarily the infinite button combo. Like, it's not infinite combo, but it's still a combo that does a specific thing. But then I propose to you, the thing is... If you use that definition, then any sort of small synergy that you put the cards in the deck explicitly for that synergy would technically be a combo. So in my Kirkesh deck, I put in any number of artifacts specifically because with Kirkesh on the field, I can pay a red to augment their effect. Is that a combo? Mm, That's less combo and more synergy because I feel like that's more general type things. Like Kirkesh just synergizes well with artifacts. But if you were saying, like, this com- this interaction doesn't work with- specifically without Kirkesh, then I could get more on board because there's a specific part to Kirkesh being involved in there. For example, you could easily come up with a combo where Kirkesh is helping enable multiple untappings, right? Um, it just depends on what it is. Like, uh, let's see. Because with something like, uh, Voltaic Key, you can untap a lot of stuff with it. And it can go infinite depending on what it is. But if it's something just like, I have Kirkesh and I have a Wayfarer's Bobble or a Burnished Heart. Right, that's what I'm saying, is that's, that's more synergy, because that's more of a, okay, this card in general works well with these cards. But if it's specifically like Kirkesh with Voltaic Key is a combo, because you're using those specific cards to enable the really powerful stuff that your deck is trying to do. I think what William is trying to say is, like, a, a com- combo is, like, three cards that are specifically, like, you put them in there together, but when you look at the whole deck as a whole, like, it synergizes with, with everything in there. Like, uh, like he was talking about his the Revy deck, where everything untaps something, you know, in a whole, in concert, you know, in synchronization, it's synergy. But, like, the combo is, like, the p- specific thing he's going for to end the game. That's what I think. Do you kind of get what I'm saying, Clay? I think so. Like, the Remy deck that I have really is the more, your example of synergy rather than combo, than combo being the goal. It's, mm-hmm. the Remy happens to have an effect that lets me untap creatures. So yes. let's include creatures with invasion and creatures with tap effects, and now I'm getting more value off of it. But it's not specific cards or specific interaction with the Remy with any of those cards. True. I think it's also like a play style. Like, um, like, when you play for a combo, you're digging through your deck to find those pieces. It, like, if you're playing, like, a synergistic deck, like, every card in your deck goes along, and you could, you know, get your advantage that way. But oh, like, yeah, that's a, that's actually yeah. a very good point. Is it definitely, it's definitely your goal, right? Like, with Derevi, a lot of the pieces are actually kind of interchangeable because of the, their synergies. But if I was playing something like Sidri, Galvanic Genius, or the Niv Visit Draco Genius deck, then I'm actually specifically looking for specific pieces. Hmm. Like, like, players that play Arkham Dagson are, like, looking to get their Forge, looking to get their, uh, their Lattice and their Disc, and then, you know, then they, you know, they get some joy out of that, I guess. Yeah. I guess then, where would this place my Kirkesh deck, where all of the cards in the deck are played because they synergize with Kirkesh, but they also happen to combo with each other? Well, That's... where would that place that? 
that's the happy medium between synergy <laughs> and combo where they where they uh converge. He's not wrong. <laughs> okay. So we're defining combo as we're explicitly looking for given pieces because of how they interact with each other. I think that's a fair I think that's a fair assumption. Okay. So with that in mind, how many let's go on to the next aspect of combo, which is the more social one. How many pieces does it take to get to the Tootsie Roll center of a combo pop? For me, for me, I think three to four cards is about acceptable. If you, you know, I, that's three or four is about is the bare minimum I'd say I want it, my combos to take. Because when it comes to stuff like, oh, I have Kiki Jiki and Resto Angel, or I just got the, uh, uh it was cranial, it's cranial insertion and, oh, what was that black enchantments? I want to say Blood Chief Ascension. You know. Oh, uh, Mind Crank? Yeah, Mind Crank and Blood Chief Ascension. When you get just two card combos like that, you know, I understand the need to have kind of a, okay, f- fuck this, we need an emer- to get end the game, two card combo, go. Like, I understand the need for that. And in fact, Rich over at Card Advantage, uh, podcast, which is a fantastic podcast, and you should listen to it, also advocates for every deck having that one, yeah, we just need the game to end now button. But for me, it kind of erases some of the effort and some of the struggle that we had in that game up until that point for you to just go, okay, yeah. I I win, and now everyone else is dead. I can definitely see how that can be the case. There have been plenty of times where someone finds their win condition when no one else is ready for the game to end, and it's just like, well, it feels like we just wasted an hour of our lives. Kind of, yeah. It's It's kind of like that whole sway of the stars feeling where it's like, well, everything up to now has just been invalidated. Yeah. I'm not saying that you shouldn't be playing two-card combos. If you want to, by all means, go ahead. At the same time, though, we're kind of going for a back-and-forth game. For someone to just kind of win it out of nowhere, it kind of robs us of that feeling. It get, those are the kinds of win conditions where it's, we're more likely to say, okay, so you won that game, we're going to keep playing for seconds. <laughs> I think uh, two-card combos... Oh, um you got to remember that we're playing hundred card decks, and uh, you know you're not always gonna you're not always gonna get there. I know there's theaters and everything, so I mean it's a it's an inevitable thing to happen. But hopefully by the time you get all your things together, the game has already you know gone back and forth a couple times. And I think also as like the guy that plays the two card combos, you have to kind of uh, understand when it when you should play that. You know like uh, you know like. If you're low in life or whatever, or, you know, or you let people battle it out and then you just win the game. I, I don't know. <laughs> and see, I've heard that argument before, before where it's like, oh, I don't have any real ways to search out the combo. So if I just happen to get it, then OK. But the, but that doesn't really change the feeling of, OK, he just got his combo and he just won. Like, it didn't matter that he was way behind or... You know, that we had been fighting this attrition war for the past 15 minutes. It's, okay, he just got his combo and it just happened to win. I'm not sure if I actually feel better or worse about it ending that way. Because on the one hand, it does create some exciting tension for you if you're playing that deck, right? Where you're like, okay, I just need to hold him off until I can get this piece and hope I can top deck into it. So if you're playing that, that deck, you can actually get some very interesting tension which that will affect how you play out your game. The problem comes when you're playing against that deck, and you feel like, okay, I had him, I had him, and then he just pushed a button and said, no, I win instead. Okay, let's put on our thinking caps for a second. Imagine a world where everyone has a two-card combo on their deck, and it's a race to find that combo. That's what it's like to play at, like, my card shop, is everyone has these crazy combo decks. and I mean, we have other decks, too, but, like, it's really fun when everyone sits at a table, and it's just a race. It's pretty fun. I think the most satisfying games are when there are multiple two-card combos at the table, but everyone is just kind of jockeying for position to get theirs first. Right. Um, And then, of course, with other people actively trying to stop them. That that sort of thing justifies the whole thing, but if it's just like turn two or turn three, just like, oops, sorry guys. No, and I can actually agree with that sentiment. In fact, if I were to do a thing in my shop where it's like, okay guys, this week it's going to be Combo Tuesday. You know, go ahead, bring out your combo decks, and we're just going to have a combo ward to figure out, you know, just kind of make that the theme of the night. I could get ahead, I could, you know, get with that because I'm signing up for that kind of game ahead of time. I think my real issue has been more of the, I have a certain expectation of how the game plays out, 
And then the two card combo comes out, and I'm just like, I this this wasn't the kind of magic that I wanted to play tonight. And but, right, and uh, that, that's why I have multiple. You know, we generally have multiple decks, and I don't start with a combo deck. I I accelerate to a combo deck after like if I get beat by a, a turn five combo, then I'll grab like a a more combo ish deck. Yep, and like I said, that's actually perfectly fine. You can go ahead. I actually advocate for people playing what they want to play. This is just more of a discussion of, well, do these kind of things just kind of, I don't want to say rob the game, but you kind of feel like you missed something. Where it's just, wait, he, he won out of what? What just happened? And there's so, also, oh, sorry. No. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Jake. Okay. Uh, like, there's also like a sentiment like, if you want to play combo, don't play uh, EDH, you know, play, play like, a combo deck, like, eggs or whatever. Like, you can get your, you know, your jollies off doing that, or, you know, Splinter Twin or whatever. Well, don't play Splinter Twin, you can anymore. Or eggs, I guess. But anyway, like, uh, play a different format than Commander. But at the same time, like, Commander offers, like, it, it makes it, like, as a true Johnny, it, it makes you, um, more satisfying to get to a combo when you have, very, like, that, the deck building restrictions in Commander. Uh, I wouldn't say that. I definitely think combo has a strong place in Commander. I've got, you know, I'm not a strong combo player myself, but I do like playing combo every now and then, which is why I have my Niv-Mizzet, that's why I've got my Sidri. And those are fun decks to, to play. Sidri I went out of my way to, to build as a super combo deck, where if I could figure out a less efficient means to do the combo, I would go ahead and swap it out. You know, a lot of the combos <laughs> in my Sidri deck involve, you know, tapping artifacts, and Intruder Alarm. Intruder Alarm, particularly because I wanted to be a, uh, Sidri to be an integral part of those combos, and what she do is she turns artifacts into creatures. So if you had, like, an artifact that, once you animated, m- tapped and made a token, then it would just untap with Intruder Alarm, and it could start making it with tokens. And I made sure to, make, to start pulling out the artifact creatures that could do that, because, you know, if it's already a creature, I wouldn't need Sidri. But I wanted to add in an extra combo piece, so let's make it just a little bit harder. And Draco Genius is more or less a Stormless Storm deck. You know, get that Eye of the Storm, and it does silly things with Turnabout. <laughs> so, it's not that I'm against combo decks, or think that they're, they shouldn't be playing Commander. By all means, combo decks should be playing Commander, because there's some really cool and fun stuff that you can do with those decks. But you have to kind of take, I don't want to say responsibility, you have to kind of be aware of what kind of magic your playgroup wants to play before you bring out a combo deck. The, the, the Curiosity, Nifmas, and Fireman combo decks, you know, the two-card win buttons, they're actually fine when your playgroup's aware that this is the kind of game that we, that we want to play. Because it, yeah. leads, because it leads into what we're talking about in the strategy segment, which goes into you stop playing traditional magic, and you start playing keep him off the button, which, you know, I usually find to be irritating in terms of ways to play commander. But we'll get to that. So... The two card combo ha- has been discussed. Let's go ahead and break it up a little more. So, what kind of what do you guys feel makes it more acceptable to be playing combos that take three to four cards? Because they have a more a, a higher rate of uh, disappointment on the the operator. Like you have, I mean, you have four four or five cards, some you know three to four three to five cards defined in your deck, and you know you only have four forty life against three people. And if you're not like being proactive, you're just digging then you're setting yourself behind, but, like, it's like a, it's, it's like a complete euphoria when you pull it off, but it happens very rarely. Yeah, it basically just is, like, the number of cards that you have to put together to win the game. It feels more acceptable the more num- the more cards there are. So, like, a two-card combo, like, Exquisite Bond, Sanguine Blood, like, okay, you're playing black, you just cast Demonic Tutor and Diabolic Tutor, you found your, tr- you found your two pieces, you played them, Someone lost life or you gained life, and the game is over. Whereas something much more engine-like, where you have to spend a good chunk of the game trying to find these pieces, simply because we're playing a singleton format where it's much harder to make sure that you draw specific cards, especially if you're not playing black, um, it just takes more time and it allows the game to develop much more naturally. Right. There's also the aspect that when you start adding pieces to the combo, you have to start building around a couple of those pieces, right? Like, if my combos involve, you know, Eye of the Storm, then I need more ways to kind of make use of Eye of the Storm before someone sticks a naturalized under it and just gets rid of it before anyone else can get some value. 
or if I'm including an intruder alarm, I have to come up with more combos that are tap based. And just like uh, having like a lot of draw cards in your deck, like sets you up for only to be able to draw cards. You know, I mean, you set your deck up that way, and then you're, you know, you're leaving your front porch open. Right. All right. Oh, so- one. Oh, sorry. Well, one thing that I did was I I built this um this bricks this artifact deck with like tons of mana rocks and stuff like this, and I would have this where I would uh. Where I'd use a mirror turbine to make all these little these little mirrors, and then I'd use a card called Reprocess to sacrifice them all and like draw like twenty to thirty five cards, and then I'd find my combo that way. And you know, it's fun. All right. And Clay, did you have anything to add onto that? Um, combo is fine. Just don't overdo it. Combo. Don't re- make everyone hate you. Combo responsibly. Combo responsibly, everyone. Do not attempt to do it drunk. Ah, eh, that's fine. It's funnier that way. Especially if it's a convoluted one. Mm, I still remember one time in band camp, but I guess that's (laughs) neither here nor there. So, did anyone have any final thoughts or final discussions they wanted to have before we move on? Combo responsibly, I think he said it. That could be a teacher. All right, then. So, next up, we're going to go into our strategy segment, and we're going to go into more detail about actually playing said combos. Gives you some general advice about playing the combos, getting things together. And talk about some different aspects of different types and styles of combo playing. Stay tuned, everyone. We'll be right back. As I desperately dig through my Cinder deck to figure out what the hell I'm taking out for Clock of Omens. How yeah, that's how, it, that's how I set it up. I would use Clock of Omens and Mirror Turbine and Unwinding Clock. And you know, sometimes, if I was lucky, I had Perforos out, too. So I was, like, getting full value. And then Reprocess is, like, Sacrifice a land creature or artifact, and then I would I would uh, tap all this mana and uh, uh, and then I'd play uh, scrap mastery and bring it all back. I mean I wouldn't get my my tokens back, but I would draw so many cards. It was that deck was fun. See. <laughs> So today in our strategy segment, we're going to go, go ahead and talk about the different styles of co- playing combo, di- general advice to playing combo. So the first thing we're going to go ahead and discuss is speed and efficiency versus convolution. And, you know, the two combo decks I'm going to keep referencing, Sidri and Invisit, kind of highlight this. Where Sidri, I'm actively looking for pieces and steps to add in. They kind of make a Rube Goldberg machine of... I don't, let's say winning, a winning machine out of, no, out of nothing, kind of, you know, it's, it's like one of those crazy, uh, you know, I wish, if this were, this were a video, I'd actually just insert the Peter Griffin watching breakfast ma- get machine that ends with him getting shot. And I think that's the perfect example of what I'm going with here with the convolution. Cause I'm looking to add as many pieces as possible to create a winning formula versus the Niv Mizzet combo deck where it's like, okay, I'm looking for a certain amount of efficiency here because of what I want the combo to do. If I need to win and the game just needs to end, then, okay, it's a three-card combo that uses Draco Genius and Turnabout and either m- many different ways to actually combo the Turnabout for infinite manas. You know, this is efficiency versus a style points type combo deck. Style points decks are always more fun to build and play. Because I'm going to keep referencing my Kirkesh deck. If you're going to keep referencing your artifact deck, I'm going to keep referencing mine. Uh, the the bare bones way that I built it was let's just throw in a bunch of artifacts that I can copy their activated abilities with Kirkesh's triggered ability. And that just led to me putting a bunch of cards in there. And I looked at the cards and I was like, wait a minute, these cards do things together. So over the course of a game, we're just going to draw 5 billion cards, and we're just going to throw toys on the table and see if they end up killing people. And that is how I prefer to play my combo decks in a laid-back multiplayer setting. So more of an open-ended combo type deck. Yeah. All right. And I think I actually like that quite a bit, because that's how the Drake of Genius deck started. It was, let's go ahead, take some cards that we think we can do some stuff with, and then see how it comes together. Jacob, I get the impression that with some of the cards that you were talking about, it's a much more focused combo deck. Yeah, I like to play both, but um, some, like, uh, with the playgroup that I play with you, uh, you get punished for playing uh, those kind of decks. So I've resorted to playing two-card combo decks. 
Like right. McKay, like Micaeus and Triskelion and those kind of combos. Okay, so let's go ahead and start comp- comparing the two archetypes, right? The Rube Goldberg machines versus the killing machines. With the Rube Goldberg machine, you're throwing in a lot of open-ended pieces. Like, Clay, what kind of Oh, pieces would you consider open-ended in your Kirkash deck? Um, well, let me open it up. I'm going to cut to a random spot and see what card I find. Uh, that one is a board wipe, not a combo piece. Uh, uh, combos with people dying. I suppose. Let's see. Contagion Engine. That's a good one. Right. Um, it's a card that does something very n- nominal by itself. Like, it'll, du- it'll duplicate some counters, whatever. But yes. what it does is very open-ended. It doesn't have a specific function. Correct, because you can use it to mess with other people's permanents. You can use it to buff your own planeswalkers. You can increase the number of charge counters or plus one, plus one counters on your own things. If someone ends up getting a poison counter or two, you can slowly kill them that way. And that's just the card being a card by itself. And then when you add in other things that, say, care about those counters being there or that can untap it or copy its ability to use it multiple times it starts becoming a really powerful thing, and that's just a single card. Right. So pull out another another card that kind of gives an example of that. Oh, let's see. I mean, there's Scrap Mastery. (laughs) Um, That's a card right there. It is definitely a card. I think one of my favorite ones in here, honestly, is Grinding Station, Um, just because it is so versatile in what you can do with it. Um, let me find it real quick. Um, Blasting Station, or Grinding Station, is one of the four station artifacts from original Fifth Dawn. And Grinding Station costs two mana. Tap, sacrifice an artifact. Target player mills three. Whenever an artifact enters the battlefield, you may untap Grinding Station. So, basically, you get to sacrifice your artifacts and mill people. So, if someone is manipulating the top couple cards of their library or uses a enlightened tutor to put something on top, you can mess with them by getting rid of it. Or, if you're playing your own graveyard stuff, like Goblin Welder or Scrap Mastery, you can start filling up your own graveyard with it. Alright, alright. So, a couple of... So, the kind of be the contrast here. Because, like I said, my deck, my Niv, uh, my Draco Genius, my Niv Mizzet deck started as a open-ended combo deck because it was my first real attempt at, at a combo deck. I wanted to go ahead, throw some stuff in there, kind of see fit, tra- see what the how the combo would appear out of what I threw in there. And what it ended up becoming w- was it became an Eye of the Storm deck. Eye of the Storm is just kind of is the central combo piece where the cards that it kind of had me include were stuff like Sphinx of the Bone Wand because that's going to start stacking up really high. A lot of the spells are going to start casting over and over again. And Sphinx of the Bone Wand is just a win condition when it's comboed with Eye of the Storm. Twiddle is a one-mana instant that says tap or untap target artifact, creature, or land. It is in there specifically because it combos with Eye of the Storm to help untap key lands, artifacts, stuff like that. Like, if I have a mana geyser on Eye of the Storm, it's going to give me all the red mana I need, but I still need blue mana to cast my draw effects or anything else like that. And it's also just a super cheap instant that can go under Isochron Scepter. So those are dedicated combo pieces. A zombie is an open-ended combo piece. Because even though she's in there mostly to just draw cards, she also happens to combo with Eye of the Storm if I have, like, a Twiddle or if I have a Mob Rule, which is the smaller insurrection, where I can go, okay, the Mob Rule is going to be cast, it's going to untap all my wizards, and now a zombie can go ahead and draw me more gas to feed the Eye of the Storm. So in that instance, niv is a much more focused combo deck. So, Jacob, what are just kind of some examples from your decks where these are dedicated combo pieces and they're not really open-ended because they have specific functions? Well, one would be um, Machaeus and Triskelion. They, like, you, you basically entomb one of them and then bring, or uh, you have Machaeus and you entomb Triskelion from your deck and then you bring them back and it's very fast. Also, um, I could think of, uh, let's see... Like, um, you could use, like, a Palacron Infinite Mana deck. That's a three-card combo itself, but it's very it's very easy to get. Like, um, if you get a deck that utilizes Dead Eye Navigator and you have a lot of cards that go with them, like uh, Cloud of Fairies and, you know, all these all these types that untap lands, you could just make Infinite Mana, and you have a ton of ways to use it. You can mill them out with a Wet Wheel, or you can Fireball them to death, or you can do whatever. And I think those are more uh, fast combos because... It could come out of nowhere. 
Right. I think the Dead End Navigator versus the Palancorn is another good example of an open-ended combo piece versus a very specific combo piece. If you're using Palancorn, you're using it to generate a mana. It's specifically there for that purpose. If you're using Dead Eye Navigator, it synergizes and combos with a lot of different things, but what you actually do with it is kind of up to whatever pieces happen to be lying around. Yes. Yeah, and, and, the, and the thing about that is, since there's so many uh, there's so many weapons in, in that deck suited for Dead Eye Navigator, then it then becomes a more focused combo, because every card is with them, and you just have to tutor for them. You, once you have Dead Eye Navigator, you have everything you need. So, when you're playing a more convoluted type com- combo deck, a much more open combo deck, I'm going to start calling them, a lot of the pieces can be interchangeable. How much of your deck do you dedicate to, you know, kind of the interchangeable pieces versus pieces that help the deck flow. Because I feel like a deck, a much more concentrated combo deck, is going to be a lot more, okay, I have cards that are going to help me dig for it a lot faster and help me assemble some of the pieces a lot sooner, as opposed to a more open-end combo deck where a lot of the pieces are also just kind of helping you move towards that game plan anyway. Well, for, for me, like um, a, like a more open combo deck, you also have more contingencies in your deck for other things because you, you're not solely focused on one thing. So you're you're more apt to you know have a lot more like support creatures in your deck to to help block and to help do other things. And when you're um, when you're playing like a like a a very focused combo deck, you aggressively mulligan until you get these these things, and then you know it's just a matter of time, like. Uh, you can more go with the flow with the open combo deck because, you know, after a while, stuff will just come to you. How do you feel, Clay? Clay? He just said, be right back. Oh, okay. Oh, I see it now. Okay, then I'm going to... Uh, let's see. Well, with my Sidri deck, it still has a bit of the, um, uh, the remnants of its original Sharoon build, where, okay, there's a lot of stuff to recur pieces, there's a lot of ways to recycle pieces. You know, it's got the uh, Kodolthia Forge Master, which is the artifact creature sack. Uh, tap, sack three artifacts, and you can go ahead and tutor four an artifact and put into play, I believe it is. So, there's still that aspect to it. There is a lot of, you know, contingency. There's, okay, I don't have my intruder alarm, but these artifacts still do other stuff together. Like, Master Transmuter still combos with, well, it's not really, well, it still works very damn well with, like, a Spine of Isha or the Mirror Battle Sphere. You know, Liquid Meta Conan is in there to help the, uh, it goes well with Sidri in terms of being a strip mine type effect, but if it ever gets to the point where I got, you know, Intruder Alarm and a Dark Steel Ingot and maybe something made tokens, I could go, okay, Sidri's going to animate some stuff, and now I have a way to just Armageddon everyone except for me. So there are definitely contingencies built into Sidri. With Niv Mizzet, it's a little more, we'll say, stressful. So, before we move on to the next topic, Clay, now that you're back, how much of your deck do you feel like you need to dedicate if you're playing a more uh, concentrated combo deck versus a more open-ended com- combo deck? Because I, I guess um, the, uh, the biggest thing is kind of like what the rest of the shell of the deck is, especially with a concentrated combo deck. Because um, if you're playing like mono-black necrotic ooze, you're probably aiming to get the creatures into your graveyard as soon as possible and get the necrotic ooze on the board as soon as possible and just kill everyone. Um, whereas if you're playing niv it with Curiosity, you're probably just playing a control game until you draw your win condition, at which point it's a control deck and not specifically a combo deck. It just happens to win with a combo. Right. But the flip side is that you could also build like a Firemind deck where there are a lot of wheel type of effects like the... um. Uh, Ah, uh, what was it? The, the blue one. Wind. Wind's a change. Windfall? Yeah, windfall. Windfall or winds a change. You know, a lot of stuff like that. Where it's not In a, order to try and find it. Right. Where your commander is a very specific part of that combo, but you have a lot more open-ended pieces that actually combo with it. So you don't have to dedicate as much to digging or searching or anything yeah. like that. Um, on the other side of that, with uh, with more open-ended combo decks, just just throw the cards in there, I think. Because if the if whatever engine you're working with with the deck will get you cards into your hand and get you to your stuff, you'll find something eventually. Right. Like, and Kirkesh sometimes... draws yeah. so many cards over the course of turns where I will eventually find something that might kill people. 
Right, and the great thing is that when you're playing with an open combo deck, you just kind of throw pieces in there together. Sometimes you discover interactions that you hadn't known about before. Yeah. Which is what we'll get to when we get to technology, since I have some stories there. <laughs> the next part I want to go ahead and talk about, because we did touch up on this with the Fire Mind, is that when you have, you know, a combo, you got your combo and you play it for a few times, and people know what your combo is, or maybe they ha- even, or maybe they haven't seen it, but they have an inkling just because they played enough magic to understand what you would need to do it. You stop playing regular magic, and you start playing a game I like to call "We're Trying to Keep You Off the Button." It was one of the problems I had with the Planeswalker deck that we talked about uh, last week, and it's that you're playing this mini game almost where they know you need, you need to do a thing. You know you need to do a thing. They're trying to desperately to keep you off the thing, and everything that you're doing to stay alive so that you can do the thing keeps you from doing the thing. You know, the the uh, the story I have is I was playing Draco Genius, and one of my friends had the Daxus beats going on. You're just, just just throwing tokens everywhere, and at this point, I know that the only way that I'm going to be able to win is if I pull off a reiterate infinite combo. The pro, you know, with turnabout. The problem is I don't have enough mana to go reiterate turnabout infinite mana yet. So I have to keep using turnabout to actually keep him off, to keep him off of his tokens. You know, go attack phase, turnabout, tap down all your guys because they have shroud and you can't just target one. The good news is I have like four or five different ways to recur turnabout because turnabout's a key combo piece for that deck. The yeah. bad, bad news is every time I have to keep, you know, recurring turnabout, that's a turn I don't have the mana to go turnabout reiterate win. But he knows this. So every time he goes to attacks, it's a threat to kill me, forcing me to use the turnabout. And it goes like that until he gets the graveyard hate to get rid of turnabout before I have a chance to get it back. And at that point, I can't win because I, I'm out of options at this point. He kept me off the button, and he was finally able to just take the button away from me altogether. Yeah. So what are some of the things that you need to do when you get into, into that situation? Like, for me, it was, okay, except the fact that if I don't want to just die, I have to kind of use my combo piece to stay alive and hope that I get the recursion in order to keep the, the dream alive. Mm-hmm. What happens think, to you guys when that when you get into situations like that? Well, for me, like, when I play my Sidri open combo deck, I, I stop being a combo deck and start becoming a beatdown deck. Uh, I think that's one way to do it. Now, that's not always what's right for the situation, but if you see the person is, you know, open, you can take advantage of that. Also, like, uh, Niv-Miz is, he's a 5-5, right? Or is he a 4-4? Yeah, Drake of Genius is a 5-5. Yeah, he's a 5-5, so he could, he could get in there, and he's a flyer, so. Right, and that actually isn't bad either, because there were games where I have Drake of Genius out, and I do kind of start playing a more control game, where, okay, I just have a 5-5 dragon, you guys can't get past that. And, oh, he's just incidentally drawing me cards with my extra mana. What about you, Clay? Well, I'm going to say that if some of Kirkesh's combo pieces go away, I look for a different combo. Like, if they end up in the graveyard and someone exiles all the graveyards, or I'm forced to crack a relic of Progenitus to stop someone else from comboing off, I'll just go find something different. And if that doesn't work out, I will just sit there and gracefully accept my fate. Because all Kirkesh wants to do is tinker around with his toys, and by God, that's what we're going to do. And see, I think that's one of the benefits of playing the more open-ended combo decks, as opposed to the more concentrated combo decks. With a concentrated combo deck, you desperately try and get that button. And without yeah. that button, you actually don't win. But with a more open-ended combo deck, you know, like Sidri, if I'm trying to go for time C, but suddenly I realize I don't have the pieces for that anymore... I can always alt out of that and go for the Solve New Phyrexia Oblivion Stone Academy Runes combo, where where it's not really winning the game per se, but it soft locks people out of playing creatures, and now my Nornzilla can actually beat people down into submission. <laughs> now my Sidisi Zombie Tribal deck is kind of in an awkward spot where it is at its core a beatdown deck but it does play infinite combos as the, this, I am going to kill you now, so just concede. Which is a completely different style, because I am actively doing things other than searching for my combo pieces throughout the course of the game, but if I do get my combo pieces, which I do occasionally specifically search for, I will combo off and kill everyone. Right. I do the same, oh sorry, I do the same, 
I, I do the same thing with uh, my Prosh deck. I um, it's it attacks at so many axes. You know, like I could kill you with with Prosh, especially if I have like Pain and Strike in my hand, which I I like to do. I like play Pain and Strike, people. Just play it, all right? It's an <laughs> awesome card. Just play it. You could, I mean, you could sneak it in and, like you know, guy X is attacking guy Y. Oh, nine damage. I'll take it. Whatever. Pain and Strike. That guy's dead. You know, you didn't even have to attack. But you know, but. I also have a couple combos in there. I mean, I had the food chain combo. I mean, I think everyone does that plays Prosh and has 12 extra dollars. Um, you know, you can go in from that way, or you can just attack uh, regular straight up. Uh, let's see. There is something I want to touch on, and that was which I realized when I was talking about the Nornzilla and Oblivion Stone. It's combos that actively win the game and combos that lock people out of the game. So let's go ahead and touch on that. I actually do kind of discourage combos that soft lock people out of the game as opposed to actively winning it. You know, like, the classic two-card combo with this is Teferi with the, uh, with Possibility Storm or... Knowledge the, Pool. Or Knowledge Pool, yeah. Card... Or, or Mind Slaver Academy Ruins. Um, yes, that on a... I'm not sure on a lesser or more scale. You know, Elish Noir, Cormispell, and Urborg, which is admittedly a three-turn, three-card combo but it also kind of locks people out of the game. Combos that keep people from playing, you know, whatever kind of magic they're playing. Yeah. I actually do kind of want to discourage those combos, because even if as a last resort, it's not a, a type of combo that makes people feel like you accomplished anything, per se. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. Like, totally. I've got Oblivion Stone and Soul of New Phyrexia and Academy Ruins in Sidri, because those are actually just powerful synergistic cards. You know, protecting yeah. my combo pieces, recurring my combo pieces, a wrath that actually just is an artifact. The fact that those three together with enough mana actually softlock people out of creatures, it's just borderline en- enough for me to feel bad if I have to resort to that combo. On the other hand, they're still free to cast spells and to try and get rid of my, my pieces. You know, yeah. you know, a uh, exile effect in response to me trying to get back with Academy Ruins. You know, swords to plowshares to get rid of Soul New Phyrexia. There's still w- there are enough ways to interact with that co- soft lock. It's why it's a soft lock as opposed to a hard lock. But when you get to to fairy and you don't actually get to cast any of your spells ever because you because of rules interactions and stuff like that, or Elish Nor, I actually just wipe all your lands. That's there's no way for you to actually fight back from that. You just yeah. kind of feel I don't want to say helpless, but it's more like you just got stuffed into a sack, taken outside, and beaten with a load of potatoes. <laughs> Fair. Which actually, you know, now that I think about it, a lot of the decks that Bakura from the original Yu-Gi-Oh! anime played were exactly like that. They were lockout combo decks. So, if I wonder if anyone who watched Yu-Gi-Oh! grew up with that same stigma against lockout decks. What about this lockout deck? I played against this before. Stranglehold and Marilyn of the Morn Song. That would be another one. That's, a, that's prison style, man. <laughs> yeah, prison style, and any sort of just stuff like that. Yikes. That guy also had, it was basically an ad nauseum deck. It was pretty cool. Yeah. So that's more or less my take on the pl- the playing, the keep you off the button type things, the you know lockouts versus the actual progressive combos. But the uh, actual progressive combos, there are a lot more ways to interact with that than just the lockout decks. So let's go more into just general combo type advice. Clay, do you have like general advice that you would give people if they're building combos or piloting a combo deck? Um, all right. So my first thing is um, having the combo is important, yes. But being able to get to your combo is even more important. So whatever engine that you're using in your deck, whatever shell you're using, make sure that it can get you to what you need fairly efficiently, even if it's not quick, depending on what your playgroup does. If you play really long two-hour dirtily games, that'll be plenty of time for you to set your stuff up and be able to get your engine going and find where, find what you're looking for. Um, if you are playing a deck with a combo in it for the first time, do not actively complain about how close you are to getting that combo to happen, because that will most definitely uh, get people's attention. Um, I was three cards away. Yeah, that sort of thing. Um, also, if you're playing a more open-ended combo deck, like some sort of artifact Rube Goldberg thing, 
it's much easier to fly under the radar until you're ready to kill everyone. Because if you play against people who haven't seen that sort of deck before, everything just kind of kind of looks a little bit innocent until it all just comes together and one thing leads to another and your blasting station sacrifices a dude that makes four mana to pay for the Nim Death Mantle that brings it back, that untaps your blasting station to tap, to sack it, to get the mana to bring it back, etc. If people don't realize that that's about to happen, it's their, it's their own damn fault. But also, one good thing, uh, my Kirkesh deck has maybe about 20 cards that I'll sometimes switch out just to change it up, because after people learn the combos that you're using, they'll start recognizing when you're uh, putting stuff together. So especially in open-ended combo decks, feel free to just switch out what combo pieces you have. Mix it up. Make it less obvious what you're doing. Oh, man, I'm just... Going through my Sindri deck, pulling together the cards that I need to try and do this one thing that I was thinking of, and the fact that I need, like, five to six cards to make this work makes me so happy. Oh, yeah. I, I should figure out what the biggest possible combo I have in my Kirkesh deck is. Like, what is the most cards that I would need? Actually, let's see. I just put away the Unbinding Time, too. I'm assuming it would have something to do with a couple of these cards here. Okay, so Jacob, did you have any final advice that you wanted to go ahead and give people who are building combo or playing it? Yeah, if you're just starting out uh, playing your combo deck, uh, make sure you um, practice your combo a lot so um, people don't think you're just turtling around. You know, uh, Be uh, conscientious to your playgroup. If you're playing a big open-ended uh, thing, try to play as fast as you can. I know that sometimes you have to think, but if you have to tap and untap many things, like, try to do it as fast as possible. Um, and, uh, yeah, and don't be, and don't get salty when your stuff gets blown up and you, you were that close <laughs> to getting your combo, you know, just, just shuffle up and play, play the next game. Yeah, the final thing I'll leave off is, in fact, emphasizing what Jacob just said, which is practice your combo. A lot of the thing that's actually going to upset people that you're playing with isn't the fact that you're comboing off if you're, if it's, what. Well, most people will be fine with the combos if it meets their criteria for what makes for a cool combo. Yeah. But it's going to upset them when you take forever to execute said combo because you're not familiar with how the cards interact, with how the rules enable the shenanigans, or if it just takes forever to resolve it. Like with the Drake, with the my, with the Eye of the Storm combos that I make with the Drake of Genius deck, I do try and make sure I get the win condition out as soon as possible. Whether it's the one copy of Lightning Bolt, or it's the Sphinx's Bone Wand, or just something, and I make it clear that even though the combo isn't technically infinite, it is comboing off enough that everyone is going to be just dead from all the triggers that are happening, and then they'll go, "Okay, let's go ahead and start the next game." So. That does it for our strategy segment for combos. Next up, we're going to go into the technology, and we're going to go ahead and share some of these combos that we're going to talk about in detail. Stay tuned, everyone. We'll be right back. All right, I found my nine-card infinite combo in Kirkash. Like, it can't kill anyone unless you have the ninth card. I found... Granted, three of the, four of them could be replaced by one other card in deck, but that's beside the point. Okay. I found the eight-card combo I would need to do a one-sided Armageddon. <laughs> so today in our technology center, we're going to go ahead, highlight some cards to kind of demonstrate the different kinds of combos that our decks are capable of doing. And if they happen to inspire you to kind of build off of them, or maybe you just want to try these combos out for yourself, by all means, go ahead. So the first one I'm going to go ahead and start off with is a very basic combo. It's the... it's Okay, both of my combos usually involve Turnbout or Twiddle or some iteration of that. I'm going to start with my Emergency Win button which, as I was saying earlier, is a combo that involves Turnabout, with Turnabout being a 4-mana instant in blue that says me may choose to tap or untap target players' lands, creatures, or, or artifacts. And I like the combo that with Reiterate and or Nivix Guild Mage. Reiterate is a 
one in red red instant that has buyback for three and it says copy target instant or sorcery. So when you do that with turnabout, you have to have at least ten mana available to actually do that. You go ahead, you copy the turnabout while the turnabout's on the stack. You know, turnabout can be untapping your usually it's untapping my lands. So it will copy it on that mode, goes back to my hand, it'll untap my lands with the original still on the stack. So I'll go ahead and tap all my lands, use six of that mana to use Reiterate to copy turnabout, the rest of the mana will still be floating. So the copy resolves, all my lands untap, and I now I have net gain mana. So you just announce that you're going to be doing this over and over again, and it's a way to generate infinite mana. And one of the reasons why I like Niv Visit Draco Genius as my commander over something like Niv Visit Firemind or Melek or Coronas or anything like that is because when I have infinite mana, the Draco Genius is an outlet to infinitely shoot people to death. Now, the reason why you can use Nivix Guild Mage is the same reason. Nivix Guild Mage is a 2-mana 2-2 uh, for blue and a red. And he has an ability that says, for 2 blue-red, you can copy target instant or sorcery. So for 2 mana less on that turn that you execute the combo, he can actually do the same thing for iterate. You know, it's 6 mana if you want to drop him that turn, but if you're t- kind of mana and they don't, and you think you can protect your guild mage or he's not going to be bumped off, you can drop him a turn early and get the combo off that much faster. Of course, the Nimix Guild Mage also comes with the utility to loot for 3 mana, so I like that. He's also a, a zombie target for drawing, so the Guild Mage has a little more utility than Reiterate does. Alright, so Clay, go ahead and share one of your combos with us. Okay, um, I discovered a really weird combo while building Green-White Enchantress with Kron the Dawnclad that uh, involves a couple auras and this cute little thing called Cloudstone Curio. Um, so Cloudstone Curio is a three-mana artifact that says, whenever a non-artifact permanent enters the battlefield under your control, you may return, I think it's target permanent, that shares a card type with that permanent to its owner's hand. So generally the way that you would use this is like, I have an acidic slime sitting on the board, I play a Lanoir Elves, and because it's a creature, I can bounce the Acidic Slime back to my hand to replay it and blow something else up. So that's all cool. So we start with that as the core. It's one of the four artifacts I play in the deck. Um, and then we found this weird enchantment called Nature's Chosen. Um, Nature's Chosen costs a single green. Let's pull it up here really quick, just to make sure I get it right. Um, it's from Alliances, so it's way back there. Um, enchant creature you control, so you can only target your own things. Zero. Untap enchanted creature. Activate this ability only during your turn and only once each turn. So, it's half of instill energy where it can give it, you know, pseudo vigilance. And then it also has tap enchanted creature. Untap target artifact creature or land. Activate this ability only if enchanted creature is white and is untapped and only once each turn. So basically, if I have a white creature on the board, say like a Hopeful Eidolon, I can tap it to untap an artifact creature or a land once per turn each turn. So we have that. So then how do we abuse this, you might ask? Well, what we can do here is we can add in Nykthos, Shrine to Nyx. So let's say I have five Devotion to Green. Um, we're going to activate Nykthos and make five mana. We're going to then cast, we're going to activate our Nature's Chosen to untap our Nykthos, activate the other ability to untap our Eidolon. Then we're going to play, say, Exploration, another, like, one-cost green enchantment. That will enter the battlefield. Cloudstone Curio will trigger and will bounce Nature's Chosen back to our hand. Then we will recast Nature's Chosen on the Eidolon, bounce Exploration back to our hand, and now that Nature's Chosen is a completely new object, we can activate both of its abilities again. So we'll activate Nykthos once again, make another 5 mana. At this point, we have an extra green floating. And then we activate Nature's Chosen to untap Nykthos and untap the Eidolon and play the uh, Exploration again, and we just loop this for infinite mana. Because the deck is Enchantress, it has various ways to abuse this, say uh, Celestial Ancient or Sigil of the Empty Throne, or any Enchantress effect to draw cards. Um, basically gives us infinite mana and infinite enchantment ETBs and casts. All right. Convoluted combo. Yeah! All right, Jacob, go ahead and try and one-up us. Well, I don't think I could one-up you with, uh, because all your combos seem to have a lot of cards. <laughs> uh, but I have this one that I like to call Death by Ornithopter. And, uh, so what you do is you, um, you set up a nettle drone, 
uh, you know, a draft favorite metal drum from Battle for Zendikar. And you, um, when, when he, uh, it, it's even better if you have, a, if you have haste, um, cause then he can tap right away. But you, basically what you do is you cast, uh, retraction helix on him, and then you cast a, um, ornithopter for free, and then you tap metal drone, and it bounces back to your hand, and then you play it again, and then you untap metal drone because it's a colorless spell. And, uh, where it, it could win you the game is if you either have a Perforos God of the Forge, it could constantly do damage to you, or to all your opponents, or you do, uh, you use Altar of the Brood as well, and then you can mill everyone out. I like killing people with a zero cost, zero two. Alright then. So, it's, uh, let's see. <clears throat> so the next combo I have is more of the, uh, the core of the Fire Mac, of the, uh, I'm sorry. Of the Niv Mizzet Draco Genius combo deck. And this was the one that I discovered and realized I really liked. So I decided to start building the, and tuning the deck towards this combo, which I call Stormless Storm. It involves Eye of the Storm, which is a 7 mana instant from the original Ravnica that says whenever a player, any player, casts an instant or sorcery, exile that instant or sorcery. Then they're gonna, they may cast any cards that were exiled with Eye of the Storm as copies. So what you do with Turnabout, because Turnabout is one of the key comp enablers for this, is you can use Turnabout to untap all your lands. Use a copy of Turnabout to untap your lands. So you can go ahead and cast a new spell. Usually, I'll go ahead and get the Lightning Bolt or an Incinerate or some, some sort of really small burn effect going onto it so I have maximum damage going as fast as I can. The next thing I'll go ahead and do is get the draw spells onto it. Because with any sort of gas type effect, any sort of small anticipate or anything like that, Casting those are going to help trigger the Eye of the Storm, which will trigger more draw effects, which will trigger more burn. And every time you're able to cast a small an instant, you can go ahead and re-trigger those effects. And they keep stacking on top of each other, just like a, a normal Storm deck would. The key here is making sure that the spells you're casting are small enough so that if someone were to go, okay, in response to you casting that, I'll go ahead and stifle the trigger or anything like that. So that you can then go, okay, in response to your stifle, cast this instant speed, anticipate, or a oh what, what else do I have in here? I've I've even got I've got a lot of really small stuff like impulse, uh, fire and ice, reverberate, anticipate, telling time, lightning bolt. A lot of really small type effects. A lot of stuff like the original uh, uh, is it guild mage would be able to interact with, and it just builds like a storm deck. If you're if nobody has any sort of instant speed type interaction with it, or you're not on a okay I have to go all instance or this just dies right now, then you do have time to go ahead and drop like an Azami to keep drawing some more cards, get the Sphinx Bone Wand, which is the biggest and fastest way to win with the Stormless Storm deck, and I have a lot of fun with that one particular combo. It was a lot easier when I could go uh, on missions, because it would just let me keep drawing the free gas for free if I didn't have turnabout. I had to take on missions out when I did the Great Mythic Purge, though. The original intent of the deck, though, was to go uh, Leyland of Anticipation or Vidalcan Orrery. We're going to go ahead and flash in Eye of the Storm. And then, let's see, what was it? In response to the... Ah, I can't, I can't actually remember what, what it was now. Oh, that's right. It was originally built more around the Epic Experiment, and Eye of the Storm was a way to get, actually get Epic Experiment to work. It was in response to Epic Experiment, flash in Eye of the Storm. Then, when Ep- Epic Experiment goes off and casts all those new instant sorceries off the top of your deck, then those would get exiled under Eye of the Storm, and you would just start making a ton of copies of whatever your epic experiment grabbed. So that was the, the so that's the uh, that was the core principle of the Draco Genius deck. Clay, did you have another combo you wanted to share? Um, I have two different Kirkesh combos. One of them is silly, and the other is actually lethal. Um, I think the highest count I can actually get to for a single lethal combo is probably six cards. I'm not sure if I can get much higher without just adding random things into the mix. But my favorite combo that I've managed to make with Kirkesh is having Kirkesh on the board and playing Prototype Portal. And with Prototype Portal, we're going to imprint Great Furnace, which is the red artifact land. Um, and then we also have our Voltaic Key. So what we're going to do is... Er, okay, we do also need Kirk Clan Ironworks in this one, so it's five cards. Um, 
So we're going to uh, activate our prototype portal and pay a red to copy it. So we're going to make two copies of Great Furnace that are going to enter the battlefield. So we made two lands for one mana. That's pretty sweet. We have Soul Rings on a stick. And it's even more mana efficient than Soul Ring. Um, oh, but putting Soul Ring on prototype portal and paying two mana to make two Soul Rings, that seems pretty good too. Anyways, um, so then we're going to tap both of those Great Furnaces for red red. We're going to sacrifice one of them to Crook Clan Ironworks to make two colorless. Um, so we have two red and two colorless. Then we're going to use one colorless to tap Voltaic Key, targeting prototype portal. Copy it using one of the red to un to uh, copy it to untap Voltaic Key. So we end up with an untapped prototype portal, an untapped Voltaic Key, and a floating colorless and a floating red. And then we just keep going and we make infinite great furnaces, infinite lands, infinite artifacts, infinite mana. Hmm. The other four card infinite combo with color fixing. Um, the, uh, the core part of it that makes Infinite Colorless, um, by itself is once again Quark Clan Ironworks because that card is absolutely amazing. Um, then we have Suchi. Um, Suchi is the one that I go with. Cathodian also works if you're using Quark Clan and not another sack outlet. Um, but to make Infinite Mana, you have Suchi. It's a 4-4 four, four for 4. When it dies, you get 4 colorless. So we sacrifice it to Quark Clan Ironworks. Uh, to make two colorless, and then we get four colorless from its death trigger. And then we have a Nim Death Mantle that triggers and says, hey, we're going to pay f- the four mana that Suchi just gave us to bring it back to the battlefield with, Dim death man- with Nim Death Mantle attached to it. So, in the end, everything is still in place, and we have two extra colorless floating. We can repeat that as many times as we want, and then to color fix it, we can throw in a gemstone array, which is an artifact, costs four, can pay two colorless to put a charge counter on it, and then remove a, car- a charge counter to add one mana of any color to your mana pool. So there's our color fixing. Now, how do we kill people with either of these combos? Um, well, the problem is the one that I'm thinking of right now, or at least the one that I have sitting in front of me, uh, requires the Suchi combo. But if we just add in Salvaging Station, six mana, tap, return, target, non-creature, artifact, convert mana cost one or less from your graveyard to the battlefield whenever a creature is... Whenever a creature dies, you may untap Salvaging Station and Pyrite Spellbomb, which is simply one, and it's an artifact. You can pay a red and sacrifice it to deal two damage to target creature or player, or pay one and sacrifice it to draw a card. So, using Suchi dying over and over, we can use Salvaging Station to repeatedly bring back Pyrite Spellbomb to either draw our entire deck or just shock everyone to death. And there you go. Shot through the heart! Okay, so that's pretty convoluted, but I think I can one-up you with one card. So this is partly because I actually ended up taking out any artifact in my deck that had just tap, put a creature out, because I realized that made things a little too easy. Like, if I did that with Intruder Intruder Alarm, I could actually just make infinite tokens, and that was only three cards. That wasn't enough cards for me to really be happy with the combos that I have in So I have no creatures in this, no creatures or artifacts that just have tap, make a dude. That's important because the Armageddon Doomsday Machine gets a lot easier to pull off if you actually just use that instead of, of a couple of pieces. So the thing that, you know, we were talking about combos that kind of t- tell people they don't get to play the game, and one of the ones that I thought of was, well... When you have Karn and Mycoson Plattis, it just becomes one mana strip mine. So you can easily just completely decimate someone's lands and keep them from playing magic. You know, and if you get, find a way to get rid of the artifacts, if they're using mana rocks or anything like that, well then you're just completely locked them out of playing magic. Sidri has that same thing though, where if I had Mycoson Plattis and I just wanted to pay a blue, I could strip mine someone. But at the same time, being able to strip mine is a very powerful tool to keep people off of, like, they're trying to nick those, they're Gaia's Cradles, you know, some really powerful and efficient utility lands. So not doing something like that is also kind of, I'd rather have that the power to do that and be able to keep them off of that without doing a one-sided Armageddon. What I realized with this deck, though, is that there is a way to do that. It just involves a lot of pieces. But something that I kind of had in there for, well, we can probably do some shenanigans. So to start with, we have Sidri. She's the whole enabler for this. The fact that she can animate artifacts into creatures is intrinsical to this. We start with Liquid Metal Coating, which is a two-minute artifact. Tap, target permanent becomes an artifact in addition to its other types until end of turn. So normally, we can go ahead and go tap, 
you know, turn your land, turn your guy's cradle into an artifact, and then Sidri can animate it, and because its power and is equal to its converted mana cost, it's just going to die because it's a 0-0, zero, zero, unless you happen to have an amp amount. So, once a turn, strip mine, that actually doesn't seem that overpowered. It's problematic, yes, but no more so than if you were just going normal strip mine crucible worlds to try and slowly beat someone back who was either ramping out really hard, or just had really powerful lands out. So, it seems okay. In fact, it actually, it's a little brittle because, you know, Liquid Metacoding is an artifact, and artifacts break. Now, with Sidri being able to turn Liquid Metacoding into a creature, that means that we can add in the other integral piece of the combo, which is Intruder Alarm. Intruder Alarm is a blue enchantment for two and a blue. Creatures don't untap during their controls untap phases, but whenever any creature comes into play, you untap all creatures. So if we find a way to bring creatures in over and over again, we can go ahead and use local metal coding over and over again to turn all the lands into artifacts. Well, what's good at bringing creatures in over and over again? It's Master Transmuter, which is a 4-mana human artifact, artifact creature that says, for blue and a tap, and return an artifact you control to its owner's hand, you can put an artifact card from your hand onto the battlefield. So Master Transmuter can actually pay a blue, tap, and return herself to her hand, and she can put herself back out. Okay. That's going to trigger the intruder alarm, and it's going to let Liquid Metal Coding untap. But she's going to need mana, so let's go ahead and get the Darksteel Ingot in there to make the blue that she needs. And hey, Sindri can go ahead and animate the Darksteel Ingot, so we can go ahead, tap the Ingot, tap the Transmuter, bring up, uh, put the Transmuter back into play, and that's actually going to untap the Darksteel Ingot and the Liquid Metal Coding. So the mana is going to pay for itself. The problem here, though, is that Master Transmuter is going to have summoning sickness as soon as she comes back into play. So how do we fix that? Let's go ahead and put out the Thousand Year Elixir, which says you may activate abilities of creatures you control as though those creatures had haste. You could also use, like, Lightning Greaves, if you so wished. But, you know, now we run into another problem. There's only so many lands that you're going to have that can actually let Sidri pay the blue to animate other people's lands. Then let's go ahead and add the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7th piece to this combo, which for me is a Spectral Searchlight which really can just be any color-producing mana rock. Because now Sidri can animate the Spectral Searchlight, and the Searchlight is going to give her the blue she needs to, anim- to, turn someone's, er, to animate someone's land that was turned into an artifact with a liquid meta coating. So the Transmuter bounces herself back to the hand, comes into play, triggers the Intruder Alarm, you can go ahead and tap all the mana you want in response, or just however you want to stack it. The Intruder Alarm will untap all your creature artifacts, and Sidri is free to just one-sided Armageddon someone's lands. Now, for whatever reason, you don't have your third, your second mana rock or anything like that. You've seen an Umbiter Tyne, which is a four-mana artifact, two white-blue, from uh, Shards of Alara, that says tap to untap another target permanent. You just combine that with any blue-producing land, and you'll have the same effect. Plus, you've added another card to the, to the machine engine. Are you guys following this? Uh, yeah. That is fairly convoluted. Do you ever play the game uh, Mousetrap? Uh, yes, I did when I was a small child. Well, that's this is this is the magic version of Mousetrap. That's like exactly it. it. This is the magic version of Mousetrap. You roll your so, dice, you move your mice. Nobody gets hurt until you Armageddon them. Hmm. So if you had any other artifacts in the deck that just tapped to produce a dude, you could cut out three pieces of that combo and just replace it with that. Exactly. Which, of course, wasn't the point of the deck. The point of the deck yeah. was to get as convoluted as possible. And when I realized yeah. that, you know, none, all these other combos became pointless because why wouldn't you just make infinite dudes anyway? Mm-hmm. You know, I just cut out stuff like the Mur turbo- Turbine, you know, any other guys that made artifact, just make dudes. Like, just turning anything that taps to put a, a dude out, t- comboing it with Liquid Metal Coding to turn it into an artifact and then a True Alarm. That's a good four-card combo type thing, but yeah, I wanted Sidri to be involved, and I wanted the combos to take no less than four or five creatures, I want to say, or four or five card pieces, mm. and I'm incredibly happy with how many hoops I have to jump through to make some of these effects work. Because let's face it, if you one side of Armageddon someone, at least you have to go, you have to protect seven pieces, as opposed to just, oh, Elish Norn. Some guys, a land yeah. that you can't interact with. Whew. <laughs> I think I think my favorite eight card combo is uh, seven lands and uh, cyclonic rift. Womp womp. Good combo. I, I think one of my favorites is blue card force of will. <laughs> yeah, right. Two card combo. And I'm sure if Calvin was here, was here, he would say some iteration of red, white in your face. 
<laughs> yeah, like, his combo is like 17 creatures turning sideways. Yeah, that's actually just the best combo right there. All right. It is a combo. It is. It is a combination of cards that ends the game. Okay, Jacob, I think you had one last combo you wanted to share? Sure. So I have a fondness of the creature murderous redcap. Uh, that's why I call him everyone's favorite goblin assassin. Um, he's been doing the Perforos thing before, way before Perforos even thought about it. Um, when he comes in to play, he does two damage, or he, he does power equal to his, uh, his, he does damage equal to his power, and he has persist, so when he dies, he goes to your graveyard, and then he comes back with a minus one, minus one combo, or, uh, counter, so he does one damage the second time. Now, with, um, when you combine him with a sack outlet, uh, and a creature like either Malira or um, something like that. Malira th- says that your creatures can't get minus one, minus one counters on them, so he could just go infinite with that with, like, any sack outlet. But the one I like to do is um, I use a Nim Death Mantle, the aforementioned death, Nim Death Mantle, with Ashna's Altar. I cast, um, usually I bring him out with Birthing Pod, so he hits the table, and then I sack him um, to Ashna's Altar, making two colorless. He then goes to your graveyard to persist trigger happens. He comes back with a minus one, minus one counter on him. You sack him to Ashnod's altar again, making, and so now you have the prerequisite four mana for Nim Death Mantle to activate. Then you pay the four. He comes back all anew and rinse and repeat. Fair. And I have had this combo in my opening hand, and that's kind of what, like, led me to this, uh, this topic. It was, mm. it was pretty funny. It's like a turn three kill. Yeah, um, creatures with persist uniquely have the ability to be able to do that with Nim Death Mantle and Ashnod's Altar, simply because you can get four mana out of them before you have to reset using Nim right. Death Mantle. You could also do it with like Kitchen Finks and get the yeah. you know, uh, and or if you wanted to be really cool, you could do it with uh, and you want to play complete control, you could do it with uh, what's her name? Uh, Ooh, Glenelindra. Um, you could also do it with something like um, Siege Gang Commander or Beetleback Chief or Kira or Kieran and Pia Nalar, who make extra dudes when they come in. So like you play, you play Chandra's parents, you sacrifice them and one of the Thopters for four mana, and then you just bring them back. That's cute. I also do it with um, like since I have this combo in my in my deck, I have creatures that come in with tokens or leave with tokens. So like a um like you just have to net one every time like worm coil engine is great or uh grave titan is great or um avenger as indicar is also great yeah so like here's the thing I've observed from just playing mana vault in my from the <laughs> apple build Aston deck when you play cards like that fairly they actually don't do a whole lot like without a voltaic key or other ways to untap the mana vault it's actually just kind a of, battery it's just a battery yeah and it's not that great of a card. Especially in a deck that's a little more heavy on the white devotion, like Avacyn is. Mm. I play I play um, Mana Vault in my Prosh deck, and I don't have a key or anything in there. And I just, it's so awesome to get it and, like, play it, and then on turn three, cast Prosh. There's like, yeah. so excellent. Was... Yeah, and see, like, that's doing unfair things with all tankies. You're powering stuff out. When you don't have, like, super stuff that needs to be powered out or ways to abuse the Mana Vault without paying the super cost. Right. It's like a one one time shot with in the prosh deck. Cause it's like it actually you, does what they originally intended these cards to do. Right. <laughs> and the same goes for the Nim Death Metal. You know, Andy and the crew were crowing ab- about it when it first came out because it was just a super powerful co- combo piece. But every time I try and play it, I'm playing it fairly. And it's like, I guys, I'm just I'm not seeing it. <laughs> it's because like, you're not explicitly trying to abuse it. Right. Like you're I, trying I don't to play I, it as it was intended. Like, I don't cast Nim Death Mantle until I have the pieces in place, you know, like, because I can't afford to get it blown up. Yeah. There are some decks that will play it just for recycling creatures that get blown up. Oh, yeah, sure. But 90% of the time you see it. It's combo piece, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. All right. It's like, when you see the, when you see the card Splinter Twin, there's only one thing that comes to mind, you know. Oh, yeah. Yep. But when you actually play it as just a value card, it's actually not that bad. No, but... it's it's good. Good. Okay, so that about does it for our show today. We actually had some great discussion going on. Hopefully this helps you playing combo and maybe inspire some com- some combos for you and your playgroup. So I should probably make sure my Kirkash deck is up to date and put it in the show notes at this point. That'd be pretty nice. All right, guys, so we've already had our discussions. It's time for us to take things to our outro.
Yep. Here's the like that's the, the actual thi- thing. Oh, god damn, that's my alarm. Hold on. <laughs> At least it's not Navi. No, not yet. Actually, we haven't heard anything from Navi in a while. That's really strange. We almost always, by this point, have. Yeah. Maybe but... it's because Calvin's not here. Maybe. Maybe Navi is out just uh, pestering him. You know. Yeah. Alright, this has been Commander Guys episode 237. I want to go ahead and thank both my co-hosts for showing up tonight. Clay, thanks for being here. Yeah, no problem. Jacob, thanks for being here as well. I want to thank you for letting me come on and uh, talk about some murderous red cat. Well, I want to go ahead and thank you for coming up with the topic. That actually it actually gave us a pretty decent show tonight. Ooh. All right, so let's go ahead and pass out some of that contact information. Jacob, people want to get in touch with you. How can they do that? The best way is Twitter, and uh, my uh, handle is uh, WCPower9. Uh, you could email me if you want, power9wc at gmail.com. All right, and Clay, Mr. Commander Panda, if people want to get in touch with you, how can they do that? Uh, people can find me on the Twitter and the Reddit and on Gmail as EDH Panda. Uh, my girlfriend Mallory and I also occasionally stream on Twitch. Hopefully we might be able to pick up with that again soon. We have a shiny, nice new old console to play games on now. So uh, our uh, Twitch name is Pandalpaca. It's down there in the show notes. So yeah, follow us on Twitter and get in updates on when we go live. All right. Now, Calvin wasn't able to join us tonight because his connection made it really hard to communicate with him. But if you want to get in touch with him, you can email him. He's at Captain... He's CaptainRedZone at gmail.com. He's also on the Twitter. He's at CaptainRedZone. I could have just loved that and said chase. <laughs> if you want to get in touch with me personally, I am W-I-E Hernandez at gmail.com. You can also follow me on the Twitter. I am at Luam1409. And if you're asking about my mo- motor handle, it's the exact same thing. I'm Blue Ram 1409 there too, which I'm playing much a lot more moto now that I'm doing these video series. I'm having a lot of fun. There's actually a lot of great people on moto. I actually uh, got added a couple of people to my buddy list too. So if you want to get in touch with me, feel free to shoot me a friend request. Let me know that you're a fan of the podcast, and I'll give you the accept or invite or whatever. Maybe I should just start a commander cast clan. Maybe that can be a thing. <laughs> yeah, let's do that. All right, so if you wanted to, to send something to us, General here, CommanderCast, email CommanderCast at gmail.com. You can also hit the CommanderCast Twitter up, at CommanderCast. Follow them. I'm doing my best to uh, maintain the Facebook page, you know, post the updates and the articles and stuff like that. I'm usually doing them on my lunch break, so I can actually keep tabs on the newest news and stuff, like the Eternal Masters, which we'll talk about in, like, the dangly bits. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, <laughs> You can also leave us a review on iTunes. It will read any five-star reviews on air, which I did Do not have. Do we have any this week? I didn't even have iTunes up at that moment, so let me pull iTunes up real quick. <laughs> this happened last week when you guys read my review. I reviewed you guys, and that's funny. I said boobs. Uh, yes, you did. Uh, let's see. iTunes Store. Looking up the Commander Cast. Which is just that easy. You just go to your iTunes, you look up Commander Cast, and we're right there. Usually with the uh, the MTG cast logo. We're still getting our uploads there. So, ratings and reviews. Right now we have 24 total. Was that different than last week? Uh, nope. Still Jacob's boobs. <laughs> okay, so. You know, if you like what we do, and you don't just want to leave a review or comment or anything like that, consider supporting us on Patreon. You know, some of you are donating already, and I'm so glad that I can finally start giving you guys exclusive content, your stuff exclusively early. If you're donating at least $5, you're going to get to see the Alpha video, the Alpha build videos early. If you're donating at least 10 I'm going to start, you're going to see the exclusive videos, which right now are just extra games. But I'm going to start recording some more games, hopefully get some, like, really exciting ones for the exclusive ones, because I hate to go, to go to record the exclusive video. And just have it be a 10-minute, you know, one-shot fest like one of the videos were for Arabian Nights this week. Uh, not in Arabian Nights, Antiquities this week, where two people scoop because they get land screwed and I just get destroyed by the rune player. No. <laughs> I'm also taking suggestions for what the exclusive videos should be. You know, whether it's a, hey, do something weird with the deck with your current card pool, or anything like that. You know, if you guys have suggestions to make these a little more exciting and a little more worth your dollar, by all means, go ahead and shoot your ideas over. But if you don't want to donate that much, then hey, you can go ahead and give us the tip. And just the tip. But if a little more slips in, we're not going to complain. 
And you know what? We'll even say thank you. And a big thanks to everyone here at the Commander Cast Network, too. You know, you're all fantastic people, and I love working with you. It's a little sad that some of you have to kind of go in and out right now just due to life circumstance. But that happens. And you know what? When you're ready to come back, we'll be here and welcome you, give you a big old hug, and say, hey, glad to have you back, man. Music for our show is the x Me Type of Metal series by 331 E-Rock. We'll see you next week with more community, strategy, and technology. Until then, let's get it! And that's a wrap. Cool. All right. So, how about that Eternal Masters? Oh, man. Uh, have you been keeping a, a tab on this whole, like, vendor gate thing? Kind that's of. has been going on? I know a little bit. I don't fall. I'm not as good as I want to be on the Twitters in terms of how people are reacting to all that. But mm-hmm. I am aware that, allegedly, one of the vendors had a, an early leak list of Eternal Masters and put it up somewhere. Well, a what came out while we were doing the podcast this evening? Um, Breaking news. Apparently, the uh, the at vendor leaks person on Twitter came out and said that um, the information that was given to him that he started the investigations based on um, was misrepresented as truth, and that the person who gave him the information was trying to incriminate other vendors to get them shut down by Watsi. Ooh, that's not good. Um, so the um, Vendor Leaks page on Twitter publicly apologized for the people that had to be investigated because of this and shut down the page. There is still speculation over whether Watsi told, them, told him to hush it up because of the situation like being out of their control and having a public channel wouldn't be beneficial. But the the official stance on it at the moment was that it was not true. But okay. it, there there are still really fucking shady business practices being used by GP vendors. Yeah, because I think I remember, um, let's see, there was actually some talk that some of the vendors had advanced information about yeah. one, of the, one of the sets. I can't remember which set it was. Uh, I did hear about Modern Masters 2015 being one of them. Yeah, something like one of the vendors had inside information and they used it to unload or start buying one of the two. Mm. Whew, but that's a whole another can of worms onto itself. Like the moment that it was announced, uh, my boss and one of the co work one of my new co workers started speculating about what was gonna be in it. And it's like I'm not against speculation talk, but at the same time it's because it can it can be a fun thought exercise. Yeah. But, but at the same yeah. time when, it, they, when they start is, going, when it is still sketchy that yeah. one of the vendors, basically, like looking at their buy list prices from the past couple months, it is very clear that they at least knew about the existence of Force of Will and Wasteland in a reprint set. Right. So I am very skeptical to believe that there isn't something, some conspiracy going on behind the scenes. Well, regarding... cons- well, conspiracy came out a couple years ago. I well, mean, yes. We didn't get there, there was also the thought that the vendor leaks page could actually just be a spoof account by Mark Rosewater to promote conspiracy too. <laughs> I uh, mean, I... that would be brilliant. It would be brilliant, but it would make me want to find him and punch him in the face. Oh, well, we shouldn't be punching Mark Rosewater in the face. I think I think that if Rosewater did that, he would like if he got caught doing that. I mean, he'd kiss like his. The dream job away, you know. I <laughs> uh, see. He wouldn't be doing that without some sort of Watsi coordination, for sure. Right. Like he's so socially, social media 
conscious. Yeah, he's pretty good at that. Yeah. Oh, uh, well. So, uh, so, what cards do you think, like, at Mythic Rare, do you think? Like, if you can name um, one or two. At Mythic? At Mythic, uh, I, would th- I don't Force think... Force of it- Will? Force of <laughs> Will. That's a good, that's a good guess. I think Jace and Stoneforge Mystic are safe bets. Stoneforge yeah. Mystic, probably, because it's been a while since we've seen it. I definitely and, and if any of the second hand, third hand, fourth hand information I've heard is correct, Stoneforge Mystic might be in it. Right. Stoneforge Jace, uh Umzawa's Jite would be a cool one to see. Jite, yeah. sweet. Or uh maybe Dark Depths. Dark Depths? Mm. Yeah, that's one I could see. Uh, I mean it's, yeah. a, it's a big it's a big legacy thing. Yeah. Uh, let's see. There's a let's see, was it Lion's Eye Diamond, I think? Lion's Eye Diamond is on the reserve list. I'm there you go, yeah. I was just checking to see if it was on the reserve list. So, yeah, it can't be Lion's Eye Diamond. It can't be Mox Diamond, either. No. So, let's see. That, that, Speaking that was of the thing can, Mox what Diamond about and Lion's Eye Diamond, yeah. they've been uh, climbing. Oh, yeah. Let's see. And so, so are the dual lands. Holy cow. Let's over to NTG go. <sighs> That's just annoying. Yeah, that was the thing, too, that made me leery about this, was them saying they weren't, they were for sure not going to print anything that was on the reserve list. Which so, immediately means everyone's going to buy everything that is on the reserve list. Right. Right. Because on the one hand, this could help Legacy. You know, like, it's the Modern Masters effect where people start getting some of these expensive cards, they go, okay, I'm going to go ahead and play this format. But, I mean, with Modern... To be fair, you could use Shocklands in most places that you could use Dual Lands. In most. That's the theory, but... It's going to be out optimized by the people who actually have like yes. the car fetches and the original dual lands, and that was my concern. Was with modern, at least the lands had been dropped enough to where you could afford yeah. to actually play. Like the the uh, the Odyssey reprints and cons helped out a lot without crashing the value of Zenda car fetches. The Ravnica fetch land, uh, shock land had actually just been straight up reprinted in, in Ravnica, so those yeah. were like a, a third, if not half, the price of what they were originally. So the lands were made cheap and accessible. With Legacy, though, if there's more people wanting to get into it, then the barrier to entry just goes that much higher, unless you're like me and you play something like Death and Taxes, which is a monocolor deck. <laughs> like, we could see Goblin-type reprints. We could see yeah. you know, Death and Taxes stable I want to see Aether Vial. I, I think Aether Vial and like, a bunch of Merfolk will be in it, too. Uh, Rashad Import might also make an appearance. Yeah, I could see that. Stuff that has cross-section play with... Uh, both, both formats, yeah. Ooh, yeah. I, and, I like and the see, commander and cube. I like Mer, the Merfolk stuff is definitely up for grabs. It would be nice. I, then again, I already have all of the actual Merfolk except for True Name Nemesis. Um, like the only thing that's stopping me from converting modern Merfolk into Legacy are like three True Name Nemeses, a single Force of Will, three Wastelands, and some Dazes. I think Daze will be in it too. Uh, Daze definitely. Masters. I think they actually announced the price of the individual packs too, which yeah. is like eight to ten. Nine ninety nine MSRP. Yeah, ten dollars a pack. So if it's, we actually don't know the size of the boxes themselves. They're uh twenty eight. Twenty eight. I thought it was twenty four. Where, where, where did you see twenty eight pa- packs of box? Uh, um, I think twenty eight. Whatever. If they do what Modern Masters did, it would be. Oh no, it's twenty four. Yeah. Whatever the number for an eight-person draft is. Right. Okay, so... So 24. Yeah, so we're looking at at least... We're looking at around 240 a box. Yeah, yeah. kind of like Modern Masters. Kind of. Only my girlfriend and I are actually going to go have these on the box of Eternal Masters this time. Yeah, I'm going to do the Assuming box you guys can find a box for sale, because... I work at a game store. They will be yeah. a box for sale. Yeah. The, the the question is always just allocation. Allocation. I'm going to fig- I'm going to figure out how many boxes we're going to get. And from that, I'm going to figure out how many boxes I'm going to restrict per person on the opening weekend. Yeah. Like, I mean, how many you want to keep for drafting purposes. Yeah. Like, John's going to want to open a case for singles, which is fine. That's actually really good. Uh, like, if you get two or three, if you get two or three cases. Uh, I see, heard, he's, I heard gonna, the print. he's actually going to make a Watsi t- account because when you go sign up with Watsi as a direct distributor, you can buy three bo- because with Modern Masters, you could actually buy three cases a week, or, I think. It was either three boxes or three cases a week. Okay. But you're getting, but you had the ability to get some amount of constant product. Yeah. But I think limiting right. it to like one or two boxes per, per per customer on opening weekend will be fair. 
So I think Aaron Forsythe said that the print run will be similar to Modern Masters, uh, more than one, but less than two. Fair. Yeah. And that would make sense. The Force of the Lord is actually really sweet. It is. Yeah. I, I love Definitely how they... not a red card. I'm more excited for Wasteland, though. <laughs> I, I think it's wonderful that they let uh, Therese Nielsen do the art on it. Oh, yeah. That's so cool. Let's right. See. And, and the uh, and the um, Wasteland looks like a city of brass getting evaporated. Yeah. I need Tempest Wastelands to come down a little more so I can buy the other three that I need. Go on the OG lands. Here's my thing about Therese Nielsen, though. The art that she makes is beautiful, but I don't wonder if she's just a little overhyped right now because she has a very unique and very beautiful art style. But at the same time, she's the only one that's really doing that. Like, with the rest of the cards, Watsy's kind of... I mean, I don't think she's done many, like, stuff in standard legal sets since they've done much more strict art direction. Yeah, I think right. that's it, is that they're letting Tr- Nielsen do a lot more of these special product type stuff so that she can do her unique art. Yeah. But they're Same not... thing with, like, Rebecca Gwai and uh, Avon. Yeah, because they're using such a more uniform start style art and yeah. stamp in standard legal products, the artists aren't really getting a chance to show off their unique styles except in these special products. And a lot of the times what they're doing with the special products is they're just going straight to Therese Nielsen. Mm-hmm. Right. I like the um the art on the lands though. They're letting like uh like Noah Bradley do his thing on like the expeditions and stuff. That's that's yeah. really cool. Like those are did, did you see what happened yesterday when um Britney Spears posted a picture of the temple of uh yeah. mystery? That was so funny. I did not. Yeah, you got to check it out. <laughs> it's funny. Mana rocks are another great part of what makes this dream combo great. Because you can animate them, then so- animate something else that makes tokens. And now you have infinite mana. Yeah. I love yeah. secrets. See. And cow traps is so, so fun. Uh, cow traps. Yeah, cow- <laughs> see, cow traps is in there as a recent addition. <laughs> God damn, I don't know what I'm going to cut for this cock of a... What, what, uh, what copy of Caltrops do you have? Do you have the guy, like, stepping on Jack? Yeah, I've, I've, the... I've got the field of Caltrops for okay. the, with all the ponies. I got the, I got the one with the guy walking on Jacks. All right. So let's go ahead and go into community. <clears throat> or yep. strategy? Yes, strategy. There we go. <laughs> Too many combos. I'm okay. going to type up this combo. And I will do mine after. Let's see. Okay. You get. Up. Let's see. And I will call it Armageddon Machine. And I will double check to make sure that there isn't actually a card called Armageddon Machine. Oh, Clay, I have a combo with um with uh, uh, a okay. grinding station, grinding station too. <laughs> grinding station with enduring renewal and ornithop. Pretty cool. You sack them. He goes yeah. to your graveyard, goes back to your hand, put him out. It's pretty All right. cool. Okay, so we're going to get, yeah, so we'll go ahead, get started, and then I will type up the super Sidri combo while you guys are going. Mm. Okay. So, cool. ah, even when Calvin's not here, someone's interrupting me. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Not. I've, been, I've been on like 12 times, so sorry. Okay. So today in our... Oh, te- sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that one was on purpose. Sorry. So today on I'm our... pretty te- sure it was not on purpose. <laughs> You're doing Calvin proud. I'll give you that. No, you have to say boobs right now. Boobs. But can he say that in ukulele? I don't think so. Okay. <clears throat> and you guys don't see it, but every time I say outro, I actually swing my arm and point towards the window. <laughs> like, That's... like the, like the, uh, the, the little John song from the window to the wall. I don't know. Maybe just me. See, I think this is pretty much up to date. I think I put in Blink Moth Urn. I'm trying to remember what I took out for it. Oh, right, this is not up to date. Okay, cute. What doesn't exist in here anymore, that's the question. No, the better question is, I just tunneled visioned for Roaring Reclamation and got Reclamation to resolve. Right. What madness is about to ensue? Did you discard anything that has madness? No. Oh, uh, on the net, Nim Death Mantle tip, I use Nim Death Mantle in my uh, Child of Alar deck. That's uh, really funny. Mm. I sack him. He goes to my graveyard. He comes back. Hit the button. Blink moth. I'm playing. Or... I'm playing all lands pretty much. So it's good. What else did I take out of here? Uh, Cthodian came out for Hedron Archive. Let's see. So. And then I took a mountain out for 
command beacon. Okay, if I had Muzio out... Oh, Muzio. And I had intruder alarm. He's like Beck, He's like Arkham Daxon's little brother. Yes. He's more Italian brother. Yes, he is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so if I had... My friend Josh had a backstory that he came up with for Muzio because he played a super degenerate Muzio deck for a while. It wasn't quite politically correct, so I probably won't say it on on the thing. Okay, so if I had Muzio out and Darksteel Ingot, Soul Ring, Spectral Searchlight, and Intruder Alarm, but then I also include March of the Machines, then I can just dig through my entire and then yeah, then I can just dig through my entire deck and pull out all my artifacts. Huh. Okay, convoluted Kirkesh combos. Deck list is there. Cool. I, I didn't even think about it until just now. Well, no, I would need... Li- yeah, no, wait, that actually works. Because with Marching Machines, the artifacts I pull out enter as creatures. Yes. Yes, they do. So, and then the, those three mana rocks will be just enough to pay for Muzio's effect. And, oh. yeah, so as long as I keep hitting artifacts, I can keep pulling them out. Although I would need something bigger than three if I want to consistently hit an artifact. Hopefully no one's holding up, like, a, uh, like a route or something. Hopefully. <laughs> but if I resolve and I and get uh, Darksteel Forge, that's pretty spicy. Yeah. Actually, with a Darksteel Forge, I should out. I should be able to consistently hit an artifact every time I just pull out my entire deck. Oh, I know a guy that, uh, so yeah. I'm playing against his, I'm playing against his Muzio deck, or actually it's an Arkham deck, but he had Muzio out. He has a Soul Ring now, that's the only one. He does that, and the very top card of his deck is a, is a, um, and it was like turn four or something like that. He, he is able to put a, uh, Darksteel Forge out, it was the top card of his deck, and it's like, uh, Oh my god, this co- this combo takes six cards. I'm I, I'm gonna start playing this now. <laughs> the fun fun and games of combos. If, you know, I'm gonna start calling this Sidri's Acme Corporation. Yeah, that's a good name for it. All right, you guys ready for this? Yeah. Mm. Are you ready for this? Bum, bum, bum. Mm.